So when I talk with business brokers about what a business might sell for, they will give me ideas like professional services business would sell at one times revenue, or a manufacturing firm might sell time at, at five times uh, EBITDA. So how does that relate to what you've been talking to, to us about, this discounted cash flow? Well, I think for a business broker, this is, uh, these multiples that they, that they use is really a communications tool. It's a, it's a way to tell the owner that, look, if a company's got $1,000 in revenue and it sells at three, and companies like this sell at three times revenue, the value is $3,000. I mean, it's pretty much a multiplication. The real issue is whether the, the, the traditional multiple that they, that they refer to, the standard multiple, businesses like yours sell for X, whether in fact that's accurate or not. And I think when you look at the data, what you find is in every industry, the multiples are all over the lot. And if you average them or find the median, you know, 50% above the value, 50% below, then that's typically what a business broker would look at or somebody trying to communicate on average what happens. But the average is not for any particular company that's ever transacted. The reason why the multiples are all over the lot is because the various companies that are being transacted have different cash flow sizes, their growth rates are different, and the required rates of return are different. So the multiples are really reflecting those three characteristics. So what you really need to do when you look at it is, is ask the business broker or, her, or whoever, whomever is you're working with is let me know the multiples for a company that looks like mine. Namely, uh, I have a company that's growing fast. I have a company with a high cash flow. I'm a, I run a very efficient operation. I have lines of credit with a bank, and uh, I'm not very, I'm, it's not a very risky entity. Uh, what might the multiple be for that kind of company? And I think you force them to respond by saying, well, there's a whole set of companies that have transacted that don't meet that criteria, and therefore you shouldn't be looking at it. And so I think you really have to dig deeper. So again, it's a communications vehicle, and a useful one to begin, but it's not a value, and it may even be considered a valuation metric of sorts, but it's not a valuation model. It's not a way to determine what the actual transaction price is going to be. So if we had um, a list of recent transactions and we had the detail on the cash flow and, and the, what the investor was expecting in terms of growth rate and, and the risk of that firm, we could relate those, the eventual multiples that they sold at back to those three, those three factors. Right. The multiples are always, are always related to those three factors. They're related to the size of the cash flow, they're related to the growth in the cash flow, and the required rate of return. Maybe for our audience, uh, it, it would help if we took a look at the multiple chart, and we could see that the, if we assume for the moment that the required rate of return were 20% on this business, and we just said for a moment that the cash flow wasn't going to grow at all, and the, ca and the, and the profit margin of the business were 20%, that business would sell for one times revenue. Uh, that's, what, that's what the multiple would be. Now let's increase growth for a moment. What happens if growth increases from zero? Everything else stays the same, but growth increases from zero, say, to 10%. Then the multiple goes from 1 to 2.2. So we can see that as cash flow is growing, that the multiple gets higher. Alternatively, if the size of the cash flow is larger, how does that happen? Well, if the profit margin, if you will, increases, say, from 20 to 30 percent, and we take a look at a company that's growing 10 percent, has cash flow growth of 10 percent, and its cash flow now is, the size of the starting cash flow is now larger, namely consistent with the profit margin of 30 percent, then we would see that the multiple would jump from 2.1 to 3.3. Okay. Right? And the result of that is, is that the size and the growth of cash flow, given the required rate of return, the greater the size of cash flow, the greater the growth, the higher the multiple. And that's always the case, and that's what translates in the marketplace. So to summarize, essentially what a, an owner or anybody transacting a business, if they're looking at comparables, as they say, the comparable that you should be looking at should be a clone of, the, of your company. It should be your company, owned by somebody else, if you will, that recently transacted. And if the cash flow size and growth and cost of capital are the same, 
then you could expect that multiple. If, in fact, that multiple represents a transaction that, that occurs at about the same time that your firm is going to transact. So I guess one way to look at it is that if you are thinking about advising your client on the value of their business, they really do need to understand what the cash flow method would, would tell them. And then these comparables can provide some context to see whether similar firms to, to, to that firm um, sold at a rate that would be consistent with those kinds of assumptions. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, in terms of we've got a value here for, for a company based on the discounted cash flow, but with private companies, there are other issues that come up uh, from what I understand in terms of, uh, I believe one is called the liquidity discount. Can you explain that for us? Well, uh, private firms, by their very nature, uh, are not public. Uh, therefore, their securities or economic interests in those companies are not transacted in a marketplace. So we in finance would say they're illiquid, that is, ownership interests are illiquid. And so if we had two companies, and let's say the shares of, of, the, of, uh, of these two companies, one was public, was selling at $10 a share, and the same identical company was private, everything the same, size, earnings, cash flow, uh, that the private company would sell at a discount to the public company. And what might that discount be? And this is a, this is a very contentious issue and still uh, a raging debate within the valuation community um, as to what the size of that discount should be. Uh, based on the research we've done at Axiom, I've done at Bentley College, it seems that the, the starting point for liquidity discounts is in the neighborhood of 20%. Now, why is it such a raging debate? Well, it's a raging debate because it's hard to calculate. It's hard to compare uh, a private and a public company. Essentially, what you have to be able to do is say, here's a public company, and here's a private company that's an exact clone. And they often don't occur in that way. Uh, so you have, to make some assess you have to make some assumptions, some assessments. And so it's, a, it's muddied. It's muddied. And even when we use sophisticated uh, econometric analysis to look at this issue, the errors embedded in the analysis are very, very large. So there's a lot of uh, uh, movement around what I'll call the central tendency. But I think the, when one looks at all the research together, rather than any one particular piece of research, I think the 20% number becomes uh, one that's uh, uh, substantiated and, in fact, has been referenced uh, more than once in, in, uh, in court cases, uh, most notably and most recently is in the Gross case. Uh, which was gross versus uh, the IRS. So the IRS is when these issues really become uh, important and actually become contentious because when someone's gifting uh, shares or there's some issue with an estate tax, uh, this, the amount of that discount then really influences what the ultimate tax payment would be. That's exactly right. Uh, the IRS, over time, has taken a, uh, what I would consider a much more conservative approach with regard to discounts. Conservative both in terms of size, namely smaller, and second, they've uh, directed themselves to what the academics are saying, are saying, rather than what I would consider the practitioners are saying. Uh, and, and the reason they've done that is because the academic research tends to be very, very robust. Uh, it's very uh, well articulated. And uh, the IRS feels more comfortable because the people that are actually doing the research don't have a vested interest in the outcome. 